Thank you, Raquel. Staying on the topic of autonomous vehicles, I'm excited to introduce our next Fireside Chat guest, Drago Angulov. Drago is a distinguished scientist and the head of research at Waymo. Drago focuses his research on pushing the state of the art in autonomous driving. Prior to joining Waymo, Drago spent eight years at Google, first working on 3D vision and pose estimation for Street View, and later leading the development of computer vision systems for Google Photos. Scale was initially founded with a focus on self-driving and perception, and we are always grateful to connect to Drago to learn about his research and how the Waymo team is working to make autonomous driving a reality. Drago, welcome. And Alex, thank you. The stage is yours. Drago, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we've known each other for a while, but always excited to chat with you, and uh, thank you so much for joining the conference. Thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, Alex, it's a pleasure, as always, talking to you. I want to start off by asking a question about uh, perception. You know, you started working on perception over a decade ago, and there have been uh, incredible advances in the field over that, over that time period. Where do you think the state of art uh, is for perception? Do you think it's so good that it's no longer the bottleneck for uh, many robotics problems? Uh, I have been working on perception indeed for a long time, since uh, around the year 2000, give or take. Um, initially, when I was at Google, I would say in the odds, perception was really good for face detection uh, and uh, maybe image matching and a little bit of OCR, but not too well. And then, I mean, it's gone to a tremendous revolution. And uh, in the last five years, I've been involved with autonomous driving and perception for autonomous driving. And I would say that every year we have quite significant advancements and improvements still, which is very exciting. I would say that currently there is a lot of this feeling in community. Some people say, oh, perception is solved and let's now solve behavior prediction and planning. I think perception naturally is the first place in robotics where deep learning entered and transformed. Um, for example, Alex Krzyzewski's uh, seminal and Ilya Sutskever from OpenAI and uh, Hinton paper uh, and work uh, AlexNet in 2012 just blasted through the existing benchmarks at the time. And so perception always come, is the place in robotics where deep learning comes first, and then it moves up the stack. Uh, and so it's been doing this for a while. That said, there's still some interesting problems in perception that we're working on. And uh, they relate not so much to the common cases, but a bit more to the long tail. This is being able to address the rare events that come at you, you need to be robust to those. Um, that's, a, that's a lot of training data potentially needed, which leads to the question of how do we develop models that need less and less training data? And there's a whole bunch of techniques that have emerged the last two or three years that are very powerful. Also, in the last two or three years, there's been a lot of progress in understanding the three-dimensional nature of the world and building three-dimensional models, whether from LiDAR or where it's very natural, also with camera. And so, so we're at this point where perception works very well for the vast majority of cases, but we still need to understand how to best handle it for the autonomous driving stack, both the rare cases and also what types of perception do you want? What is the right intermediate representations that should come out of perception module that are most amenable and helpful for prediction planning and, of course, is suitable for simulation. And this is something that we're still working out. Um, I'll give you one example, maybe. So it's a paper we published at Waymo called VectorNet. This was work from a while back, and we published it last year. Um, that shows that if you model the map as a set of polylines, as opposed to just rendering it as an image, your modeling capabilities significantly are predicting agent behavior significantly improve. This is a lot more succinct and structured representation. And then that leads to the question, OK, well, what's the right intermediate representation of a map we should be reconstructing even to feed to, uh, to next stages in the modeling that deal with um, behavior? What's the right inductive biases in our domain? So a lot of these representations we're working out now. There has been, for every specific task, like if you take 3D boxes, Maybe you can take 3D flow, 2D boxes, tracking, and so on. Like for every task, we now have very performant models. But how to put the whole thing together and which outputs really matter 
how to how to combine them, which leads to self-supervision and a bunch of other ideas. This is something that the field is working through now, I believe, and it's very exciting time still. Yeah, so you mentioned um, kind of two areas of, of interesting development, right? One is uh, being able to deal more robustly with rare cases with a long tail, and the other one is sort of uh, centralizing on what exactly is the right uh, architecture or set of intermediary um, data com or sort of intermediary representations uh, t that should be used within the industry. I, I wanted to centralize kind of on the first one. So what do you think are kind of the, the limitations of deep learning in its current form to achieve the kind of robustness and generalizability that is necessary for you know, truly safe self-driving cars? Deep learning is a great technology so far in when you specify a loss function and you pick a reasonable architecture search space to optimize that search function. It works really well at this, right? Typically, what we have done traditionally is specify average losses of some kind, like a loss over many examples. And the neural nets are really good at this. I think the and this type of closed loop behavior, closed world behavior, um, which is different from closed loop, actually. Closed world is in ImageNet. Originally, when we had this benchmark and you have a thousand categories and you need to classify between them. And at the time, we trained the model and it's really good. And it's like, oh, that's an amazing model. It can do ImageNet. And then we start applying it to regular images and it's not that good on the regular images because it, see, it starts seeing things it's never seen. And so a little bit of this is at the core of learning using deep deep learning robustly in a system and in our domain it's very important to have robust usage you need ideally very large capacity powerful neural net models i think we're moving in that direction but every once in a while when you go outside the domain the data was trained it may give you a different answer than what you would ideally want and that answer can it can be very confident potentially if trained naively on that answer i think i think when you want to build a robust system, which you can guarantee there are certain constraints met, and you want to put a big neural net at the core of it, that leads to the question, well, what's a reasonable way to do this? And that's a very exciting field currently that's developing. And there's many possible solutions. I think one of the interesting things that probably is part of the answer is having the networks and mechanisms, and there's quite a few of the networks to give you a notion of their own confidence in their prediction. And so when the network is telling you it's not that confident, then you can have a fallback. You can have a more hybrid system, or you can have one that builds in maybe not quite as general as a mapping function, but builds a lot more inductive bias in the domain, and it, and it can handle the, the cases you have not seen as much, right? And I think we are, we're working through how to build this type of hybrid systems. Yeah, those are uh, super insightful answers. You know, certainly this kind of problem of, uh, you know, neural networks are good at, at solving for average loss, but in the real world, average loss isn't necessarily what you're optimizing for. I think it's certainly very insightful. You know, what are the, you mentioned that um, a few of the directions that, that you guys and you've seen in the industry, um, you all are exploring for overcoming some of these challenges. What are the directions for, you know, for a holistic view of, of improving deep learning to, to solve some of these gaps. What are some of your views on the research directions that are most exciting? I can talk a bit more about the uh, autonomous vehicle domain specifically, right? And yep. we are blessed with having a wealth of very exciting problems to be addressing. Um, I have a few favorite ones, but I think I always would start as at the core of ability to make fast progress on autonomous vehicles is your ability to specify and optimize uh, a specific goal and objective. And in our case, simulation is a really crucial part of this objective because you need to ideally observe the system perform because it's a robotic system and the impact of its decisions is, uh, happens over time. And so you want a system like this, you want scalable evaluation of your system performing in, a, in realistic circumstances. Now you have two ways of doing this. You can do this by enacting a bunch of uh, scenarios like we do at Castle. Uh, it's a 91 
square um, kilometer, no, not kilometer, <laughs> acres or something area that we have that we've enacted over 40,000 various scenarios and we see how the vehicle stack reacts. And of course, we uh, have the vehicle out there in the world uh, driving with safety drivers in the loop. But I think simulation is really core because that's the truly scalable medium where you can try safely a uh, vast majority of scenarios that you may not even want to try out in the real world. And having that world be realistic in the sense that the behavior of the system there approximates that one as close as possible to the real world, and you have an ability to play out any scenarios you're interested in at scale, I think, I think that is one of the core problems that unlocks yet bigger penetration of autonomous driving. We can move from one city or two cities or three cities to considering dozens. And so that's at the core of the problem. And it's a very exciting uh, problem. I think when you talk about difficult problems and areas I'm personally excited about, like I'm a bit of an engineer. So one thing I would say is I keep thinking as I watch the autonomous driving stack about what are the right interfaces and what are the right representations to power these interfaces through the stack. And when you, you know, if you're not directly in the autonomous vehicle space, you can think, okay, there is you know, a perception prediction interface. And we talked about some of the issues there, like what is the right representation for a map or uncertainty in the map, like as opposed to just having boxes for a set of ages that you can track, which we can do pretty well. What other things need to be passed on that are helpful uh, in predicting the intent and behavior of the agents in the environment, which is one of the hardest cases. When you move from prediction to planning, right? these two problems are actually tied. And we're still figuring out the best way to solve them. And I think quite likely the, the solution is a, is a model that is joint prediction and planning in some sense. And I can describe in what sense. So you want a plan that takes into account your predictions about the environment. But you want only the predictions that relate to your plan in some sense and validate that it's safe relative to them. So you know, I can say, oh, what happens if I turn right here at this intersection, right? I want predictions. What, what would everyone do then? That already is tied to my plan. So there's this beautiful dependence that I think there's interesting ways to, to address and solve it. Um, and uh, last but not least, there is the interesting problem of planning and learning how to plan in an environment. And at the same time, you know, you want to ideally validate it in simulation. But what is simulation? There's intelligent agents in the, in the simulator that also make their own decisions in response to your decisions. And so a good simulator potentially can leverage a lot of similar technology, not the same, but similar to what you would do for planning. So there's a lot of very interesting questions that I think all of them, they, they come in this general theme. It's like, what is the system design and the framework that allows you to keep scaling this, right? I think at Waymo, uh, I would say um, we have achieved L4 driving in Chandler. This has been uh, an area where we have given many thousands of rides fully autonomously. And currently, our service there, which is an area the size of San Francisco, is fully autonomous. You get uh, what we call rider-only rides. And members of the public can and do ride and record videos and post, right? And, and this has been happening. This is a program that Waymo has the muscle to maintain driverless operation in Phoenix, in that area, since 2017 in some capacity all this time while evolving our stack. And that is great muscle that we have, right? And now. Yes, we can solve that area. Of course, maybe we would label a lot of data to solve it and so on and observe a lot of the scenarios. Now, in the next phase, we want to bring it many more places, much wider. We want a system and adapt the system such that we can. it, it learns a lot more from data, a lot less labeling, right? Leverage as much simulator capabilities. We try to build the most advanced simulator, leverage capabilities there. Uh, and so on, right? And that's that's the directions we're we're looking at scaling. You know, you mentioned a few areas that that you all are are diving into or or looking into more closely. One of them was uh, behavior prediction, and you know, I, I know we'll end up talking through all the different uh, things that you just mentioned. But for for the problem of behavior prediction, um, I think a few weeks ago you actually 
uh, announced an expansion of the Waymo open data set uh, beyond perception for the first time. What was the strategy and thinking behind that? When you think of behavior prediction being a core task, and it's currently a task that is very active uh, in the research community, there is a lot of progress being done with machine learning for behavior prediction. This is a task that is core because behavior prediction at its root uh, requires a deep understanding of the scene semantics. It, it requires understanding of context, which traffic lights are on, what is the intersection rules, what are all the signs, what is the construction here telling you, right? And, and tying it to how everyone behaves. And so it's, it's essentially imitation learning at its most pure sense with a specific loss function that you know, ultimately you pick as it, as it relates to your planner. But this is a core area which something, when we released the open data set initially, the way my open data set has been incredibly successful we had a great set of challenges last year with over 150 participants. It has been cited uh, uh, by a lot of really strong papers, which is, I think, the thing I most look forward to. They used us and uh, they developed really great models, uh, usually in 3D perception or detection and tracking. Uh, I think one thing we, re we realized when we made that data set is that even at its scale, which is close to 2,000 segments in four cities, for behavior prediction purposes, this is tiny. And I think if you do the math at the back of your head, you start understanding why. Well, you know, our sensor data in the open data set is 10 hertz. And you maybe have 50 to 100 agents at least. And the 20 second sequence now has 200 full ladder spins and shots of the camera with 100 objects. That's a lot of examples. You're like in the potentially, you know, many tens to hundreds of thousands of examples just from a sequence. When you look at a specific behavior or interaction that happens, it can just happen between two agents in the whole sequence once. And so if you want to build these models that understand behavior, you need dramatically more data. And you want also data that has mined interesting interactions in the first place. And so then what we did is we said, okay, but well, how do we even provide all this data to the research community? Well, let's give them a processed representation of the scenes with the map and with processed with our uh, research version of offboard perception, as we call it, which is very high quality models that uh, you can apply on the way more open data set, for example, and get uh, very accurate 3D tracks of all the objects in, in the scene. So we applied this to 100,000 scenes, our model, and that made you bounding boxes and tracks for all the objects super accurate moving in space time. Now that's a great behavior prediction data set because for a lot of these interesting maneuvers like cut-ins or people negotiating intersection or bicyclists weaving between cars, we have examples for all of that. So now we can study. And we made it such that compared to other data set, we made our benchmarks uh, even more long-term prediction. So some past data sets maybe do, do benchmarks of three to five seconds in the future. We made our benchmarks uh, ask for questions up to eight seconds in the future. We made the metrics more stringent and demanding as we think better uh, reflect uh, the demands of on behavior prediction. Um, so we moved away from there's a common metric called miss rate or min ADE, which is if you if you have say six trajectories guesses, at least one needs to be close to the true one. Right? These are that those types of metrics. We we make we move to something yet more stringent, and we also move to a specific interactions challenge that models your ability not to predict just for each agent what they're going to do independently, but predict joint futures for groups of agents. And so we have one task on that. And so I think this, this data set actually is, I think, highly exciting. It's very rare type of data that so far has not been available as much in the community. And while there are other data sets, we explicitly mine for interactions. We made this a focus. There's a lot of very interesting scenarios. I mean, Waymo has Know, dramatically more data behind the scenes, but out of that data, we caught some interesting examples.
And so that's what we're sharing with the community. And I think it can spur a ton of very interesting research. And honestly, this research can, can be beyond the initial uh, just uh, individual prediction or shared prediction of a couple of agents. There's more benchmarks you can do that are very exciting. And so we will be doing this as we go. Like our whole intent of the Waymo open data set has been it's a living data set. And as we learn and engage with the community, we keep releasing new features and challenges there. And this is the next step in this evolution, but it's not the last. And we've got a lot of uh, positive feedback, right? And that feedback also helps us uh, kind of, well, we need to gear up on it internally and organize an effort. And a lot of people on the team in Waymo Research have put very significant amount of effort to making this data set and sharing it with the community. And uh, yeah, I'm personally very happy to be able to uh, announce those new challenges and see how the world does on them. One interesting challenge of behavior prediction versus uh, perception is that in perception, you know, the algorithms, they really achieve near perfect performance, especially as you know, the field has developed over the past, uh, the past many years. Um, in behavior prediction, you know, there's, there's kind of this intrinsic um, uncertainty in the responses, right? Like humans uh, can do different things, agents can do different things, and there's sort of, there's not necessarily a fully right answer. Um, or there's at least like a distribution of, of outcomes. How do you think about the, what the uh, what the limit is, or what the what sort of like the the goal in terms of performance uh, for behavior prediction should be? And how do you think about measuring that? That is a great question, and I'll take a step back and observe something. Right? I think what is the output of perception? Well, the output of perception is a representation that is helpful to do behavior prediction and planning on. What is the output of behavior prediction, right? Well, it's a representation of the world or the behavior of others that is helpful to plan with also. So inherently, in some sense, your true value and definition and metric on behavior perception goes through your planner. Now, when you define a challenge, you want to abstract yourself a step away from that, right? Ultimately, and there's different representations you could do behavior prediction on. And I think the field so far has settled on kind of these multiple trajectories, maybe with location uncertainty on them, if, if one desires. Um, I think that's not the only choice. So you can do what's known occupancy grids or maps, spatial temporal occupancy grids. They're the one on parametric representation as opposed to the parametric Here's K trajectories with confidences and maybe location Gaussian uncertainty uh, on the various uh, time positions along the trajectory. Now, the advantage of these trajectories is that it's a very compact representation. So you can represent very long-term interactions and behaviors very succinctly. And that allows your planner then to check that, you know, ultimately you're not going places where others are going to be and not inconveniencing them. It's a very rich representation in a very compact frame. Now, the problem when you have the trajectories is, of course, what is a good property to have? Well, you don't want to have too many, and they need to be in the right places. And so you want a metric that reflects that. Uh, I think, personally, I believe a lot of the current metrics they're well correlated with progress in the field, but they don't quite measure what they should be measuring. And I'll give you the example. Um, so there is a metric called mean ID that is in miss rate. And both of these metrics, they're quite good. They say you're allowed six trajectory guesses. And then we penalize you only on the closest. Like if the close needs to be closer or within two meters, then it's happy. I think, I think there's something else happening. You actually, this is a weak requirement. You can be stronger because you actually don't want to produce trajectories if possible, as long as you guess the right one. So there is a value. Any way you do it, you want diversity in your trajectories. You want to cover the modes, but you don't want to spray them around. There's a penalty. And so you want to modify the metric potentially that person to believe is to have more of a penalty. I mean, ultimately, again, I would say that the final measure of a good BP system is the planning metrics. <laughs> but if you abstract yourself from that, I think the one we're proposing is closer to the truth. 
even though we're providing the other ones too, because you want to have continuity. People need to understand how they do on the metrics they're familiar with already, right? But we're trying yeah. to introduce a new one that's a little more stringent. And that's inspired from object detection, actually. It's not that original. Uh, the main thing, the difference from object detection is in behavior prediction, you can never predict perfectly everybody with a single guess because all the agents in the environment are very naturally multimodal, right? You cannot be sure what the pedestrian is going to do when they sit at the intersection. They could do potentially two or three things very easily, right? And so we need representations and metrics that can handle this multimodality well. And I think the other thing you need to do is you don't want to just go for the average performance. So you say, oh, an average agents need to well predict well with the trajectory. The problem is on average, mostly everyone's moving boringly, right? I mean, we're mostly driving straight at constant speed or constant velocity, or we're walking straight at constant speed and constant velocity. That's great, but for safety, you want to, to capture the, the rare behaviors that actually affect you. And so you, you should not just average over everything. You need to be smarter than that. And typically people deal with this by bucketing into types of behaviors and making sure that for all types of behaviors, you're good, not just on average across just instances of things. So that's something else we, we have put. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you're touching on a very um, sort of deep and embedded issue of, uh, of machine learning and AI you know, for the future, which is how do we ensure that we, uh, there's maximum alignment between what we ultimately care about for the system in the real world and the metrics that we assign to them. You know, in, in it, in, very relatedly, you know, I, I wanted to actually dig in. Uh, we spoke a bunch about simulation a little bit ago. And, and I actually, you spoke about its importance for being able to build scalable uh, self-driving systems. What do you think of as the current limitations of simulation systems and sort of the, the exciting vectors of improvement and research? Ultimately, at the core of every simulation is you want to play out scenarios that you care about and check your performance of your whole system in them, right? And you want, of course, that replay to be realistic. And furthermore, you want to pick the right scenarios to play out because most of the time it's boring, right? Um, and so, so there is the following. I would say, starting from a high level, um, what makes a uh, simulation environment realistic? There's two, there's two factors. And I think the first one is very clear to everybody that gets involved with it. Well, you want sensor realism, right? So if you move around the environment, you want for your camera and LiDAR and radar, depending what sensors you have in your vehicle, to be simulated accurately, such that then you can apply a perception system and the right outputs come out, right? And I think that's one useful notion of simulation realism, so sensor realism. There is another one that is underappreciated and people have not been talking about it until recently, um, which is behaviorism. So, and this leads to agents. Ultimately, right, a big challenge of the simulator, a big challenge of driving is how do you navigate and share the world with humans? And that being the pedestrians and the bicyclists and all the vehicles that are driving and that's a very complex negotiation and interaction that happens. And unfortunately, humans are far from perfect. And they're far from deterministic. And we want our simulator to, to embed scenarios of the type that you see in the real world that you need to deal with. If you look at accidents, even for the vehicles uh, case, 94% of the accidents happen because there is suboptimal human judgment, right? And you want to be able to replay these accidents and, and see how you would do, because it's not even just you, you should not just do well in the scenarios where, of course, you shouldn't cause yourself accidents, that's great, right? And you need to follow the rules and uh, give people enough space and you know generally be safe. It also helps very much that you mitigate the mistakes of others. So a good driver needs to be able to also do that in a reasonable uh, measure. Actually, something we just released uh, a couple of weeks ago is a paper where we reconstruct using our simulation environment 
a set of um, accidents that happened in Chandler, in our area where we drive, and we put our vehicle in the shoes of the drivers that were parts of the accidents, and we could show that we can significantly mitigate the vast majority of them. Right? And this is one example of this. But so sim agents are core to your simulated realism because behavior is one of the core things you need to be ultimately dealing with. Now, beyond just this fact, I would say simulator is something else, right? I mean, the main thing it is, is you get some assurance and safety guarantees. It's part of your safety strategy. And by the way, Waymo is one of the very few companies we have put up our safety strategy. It's a multi-pronged strategy. It's a complex space. We use a whole bunch of uh, techniques, including simulation and replay of scenarios being part of them. Um, I think, I think when you do this uh, task, you also multiply the amount of experience you have. And I'll explain what that means. This is a key multiplier that you can have. So you captured a set of scenarios. And you can't just replay them nimbly because if you start doing different things, then the logged agents start doing things that completely don't make sense. But if you have good agents, you can start replaying completely different endings to scenarios than what you saw. That, that, is, a multi, that is essentially a data multiplier. You can get 10 to 100x different outcomes because now you give the agents different goals and they start executing those goals and you test yourself in a variety of ways that you did not before, right? So when you talk of data efficiency, that's your call multiplier and something that we at Waymo Research have been investing for years now. So I think we have some of the most sophisticated simulating agent frameworks and setups and agents. Uh, we gave a brief talk last year at uh, the NeurIPS conference on some of the work, but uh, I think that's generally an area that is increasingly key for autonomous driving. Hence, I went so long at it. I'm excited about it. It's a great area. Thank you so much for joining us for our inaugural Scale Transform conference, Drago. It's so great to hear from somebody who's really at the cutting edge and working on uh, some of the hardest problems facing the self-driving industry and has such clear ideas about how AI needs to improve. Thank you again. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be part of your first inaugural conference. Thanks for having me.